Good morning. My name is Justin McCready, and my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'd like to welcome you to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Austin, Texas, and our virtual worship service for August 2nd, 2020. We're an inclusive and progressive body made up of people of all backgrounds, all stories, coming together to make the world a more just, compassionate, and loving place for everyone. I'm so glad that you decided to join us. If you wouldn't mind, let us know that you're with us. In the description of the video below, there's a link to our virtual friendship tablet. Click on it. Let us know who you are, where you're at. You can also say hello in the comments down below. We'll say hi back. We're so glad that you decided to join us. No matter when you're joining us or where you're joining us from, all are welcome. Every road of peace, every life-giving path is welcome here. Every way of compassion, every road of peace, every life-giving path is welcome here. We are different and the same. Every life-giving path is welcome here. This call to community is by Gretchen Haley. There is nothing you need to bring with you to be welcome here. No right beliefs or proof of citizenship. No eternal optimism or clarity of conviction. No boundless courage or endless expertise. You do not need to know what brought you here or how you will solve that problem you are turning over and over and over in your mind. Your bills do not need to be paid and your checkbook can be a mess. Your children may have been up half the night, your hearing aids may not be working, and your knees may be creaking. You do not need to be already perfect or even halfway to belong in this circle where grace meets us where we are, but does not leave us as it found us. Where love resides in each of us and yet is somehow more than all where life still pulses and rages and heals and transforms, creating us and this day anew once again. Come, let us worship together. Our centering time today is by Shira Gura. Because of you, I'm zooming in, seeing faces I haven't seen in a long, long while. Because of you, I'm zooming in, laughing and playing and remembering just how to smile. But it's not about zooming in. It's about zooming out and finding you again. 
Because of you, I'm zooming in with friends far away and even those that live close by. Because of you, I'm zooming in, slowing down and taking one day at a time. But it's not about zooming in. It's about zooming out and finding you again. Feeling connected to everything all around the earth. Seeing your hand in everything, keeping the faith. Because of you, I'm zooming in, enjoying the gifts I often forget I have. Because of you, I'm zooming in, loving the people I think I forgot how to love. But it's not about zooming in. It's about zooming out and finding you again. Feeling connected to everything all around the earth, seeing your hand in everything, keeping the faith. a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Good day, friends. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew. You've heard the commandment, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, offer no resistance whatsoever when you are confronted with violence. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn and offer the other. If anyone wants to sue you for your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go two miles. Give to those who beg from you, and don't turn your back on those who want to borrow from you. Ancient words from our tradition for our present day understanding. Hello, welcome to our sermon time now. We're looking at a very strange passage today. Um, you just heard it in our, our scripture reading. But I'm not sure anybody really understands exactly what Jesus means here. And it, it's a reminder that um, originally scripture was not written down. It was a word of mouth. And what would happen in community is the, the rabbi, the teacher, would throw the pebble out and then other Rabbis, it would depend on, of course, the community, but the, the other people there would then give their impression. And uh, I think that the spirit of that is that we're all teachers to one another. And so I'm going to throw the pebble in the pond. And uh, then if, if you're so inclined to leave a comment at, on Facebook or uh, on the YouTube uh, conversation there. And also, if you're watching this before 1045 on Sunday, August the 2nd, we're going to have a conversation uh, by Zoom, and you can find that on our website, where you can bounce back, you can disagree, you can agree, whatever, on this passage uh, to turn the other cheek. Let me read the passage again, just because it is so very, very strange. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And sometimes that's, that reads as do not resist evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well. And it goes on. If anyone wants to sue you, take your shirt. If anyone forces you to go one mile, you go two miles. Ask to anyone who gives, uh, give to anyone who asks of you. Now, that's very strange, and um, the eye for eye, tooth for tooth was, of course, the Levitical code. It was intended to, to limit revenge. Um, it, it wasn't saying you had to poke somebody's eye out if they poked your eye out, but it was saying 
if you want retribution, stop at the level of the injury. So if it's an eye, a tooth, whatever it is, you, you do that revenge, but then you stop it at that point. It's, the Code of Hammurabi had the same kind of level. And the intent was uh, not to seek vengeance, but to limit vengeance. Martin Luther King famously said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world sightless. Uh, he was quoting Mahatma Gandhi, of course, that idea of um, nonviolent resistance. I think that's one way of understanding what this passage means. But I think Malcolm X is always a good commentary on Martin Luther King, and I think Martin Luther King is always a good commentary on Malcolm X, because life is very complicated, and there's no one set of rules that you can just go on autopilot and obey. This is what Malcolm X said, and I think he's talking about Dr. King here. He says, I think that any black man who teaches black people to turn the other cheek and suffer peacefully after they've been turning the cheek and suffering peacefully for 400 years, for 400 years in a land of bondage under the most cruel, inhumane, and wicked slave master that any people have ever been under. He is doing those people an injustice, and he's a traitor to his own people. Now, there's a lot of passion in that, and you might even say imbalance. I'm not sure at the end of his life if uh, Malcolm X would have said it exactly the same way. But there's a truth there, a very important truth, that whatever this means, turn the other cheek. It cannot be a call for the victims of abuse to, to not try to get out of that situation. Uh, Malcolm X would say, by any means necessary. But there are times when the violence is already there. And religion surely should not mean to go on autopilot and just pretend like that's not happening. We would never do that with our own children. If somebody's being abusive to our children, we're going to stop them, as Malcolm X says, by any means necessary. And there's no hatred behind it uh, necessarily, but it's, it's protecting people. But it's not reactive. Once we become reactive, then we start losing control. Once somebody's pushing our buttons, we start losing control. And I think that's where the Dr. King and the Malcolm X understanding can kind of come together. I want to suggest that it, it, probably 99 point some percent of Christians do not believe in turning the other cheek. We believe we should turn the other cheek, but that's not the American way. And uh, there's so many, you remember the song Kenny Rogers sang of the, Everyone considered him the coward of the county because his father taught him to turn the other cheek. And then his young wife gets raped by the villains of the, the town. And the final crescendo is sometimes you have to fight if you're a man. And that's, I think, what we really believe. I used to watch a, a show when I was a kid called Kung Fu. And it was kind of a Western. Um, some of you are maybe old enough to remember that. But... Um, the guy would do peaceful lessons and talk all this beautiful poetry all through it until the end in which he always beats somebody up. So it's, um, I think we have some work to do on understanding this. And I'm the first to say, I'm not 100% sure what, what Jesus said, but I think there's a principle here. Um, there's a church in Dallas, a very large church, that um, recently sang the anthem, Make America Great Again. And this is a statement by their senior pastor in a sermon. He said, when I'm looking for a leader who's going to fight ISIS and keep America secure, I don't want some meek and mild leader or somebody who's going to turn the other cheek. Now, that's amazing. That is amazing for a Christian pastor to get up and say, um, you know, I'm going to teach you this turn the other cheek stuff. But that's when you don't have power. When you have power or there's something on the line, I don't want that. Now, I want somebody who fights dirty. So 
we have some work to do in understanding where Jesus is coming from. Another uh, religious authority in our country, um, I'm sure you've heard about it, is uh, um, insulted um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez by calling her a very offensive, sexist name. And in the true um, spirit of self-deceptive um, religion, <clears throat> this was his apology that he gave. He said, the offensive name-calling words attributed to me by the press were never spoken to my colleagues. So he didn't say he didn't say it. He said, I, ne I didn't say it to her. I said it behind her back, so I'm innocent. And he said, if they were construed that way, I apologize for their misunderstanding. I'm sorry you're so stupid. Then he says, and this is what makes the apology, this is, this is perfect non-apology stuff. He said, but I cannot apologize for my passion or for loving my God, my family, my country. I cannot apologize for my passion or for my loving my God, my family, my country. So the reason I called her a sexist name is because I love God so much. That's the kind of self-deception that we're trying to work through in this teaching of Jesus. It's not something we want to hear. Whatever, whatever G Jesus means by it is not something that we are predisposed to agree with. But I think it really helps to realize Jesus is speaking more profoundly, more deeply, and not literally. Karl Marx used this passage to dismiss Christianity. He said, the social principles of Christianity preach cowardice, self-contempt, abasement, submissiveness, and humbleness. Now, if you just mechanically apply, turn the other cheek, he's correct. Right? That means that, that you have to surrender control of your life to cruelty, to ignorance, and to these kinds of things, and to not resist it. I want to suggest that Jesus is exaggerating in this whole part of the Sermon on the Mount with every topic that he goes through. When he says, um, it's not enough not to kill somebody, that's what you've heard, don't kill. But what I'm telling you is if you get angry, if you call somebody a name, you're already on your way to hell. Well, you know, the, you know, we could close shop, right? I mean, um, and when he says, if you look at somebody with lust, pluck your eye out, it's better. I mean, obviously, I'd be having eye patches and um, wouldn't be using my hands as much. Um, so clearly what's being talked about is more profound than what we're hearing at the literal level. Jesus is like a Zen master here. And what he's talking about is something uh, like talking about the one hand clapping. There's a principle here that um, is very profound. But it's not, again, it's not literal. It's a kind of spiritual judo where if somebody is um, trying to trigger you and push your buttons, you've got the capacity to let that go. That your peace of mind does not rely on the maturity of others. One very big clue that you can't see in English that jumps out at you in Greek is the word for strike here is an open hand. It's a slap. It's not a, it's not a fist. Um, it's a slap. Now that may or may not be important, but to me what that means is it's talking about insult, not injury. It's talking about indignity, not um, something that's debilitating, something that, that's, that's an assault. I don't think Jesus is saying, if somebody comes at you with a baseball bat, take your hat off so they'll have a better shot. Um, I think what it's saying is, don't let your own peace of mind and love become casualties of indignities and insults. I mean, those are bad enough as they are. I don't think he's saying you have to ignore injury. Even if it means it for yourself, uh, justice requires that we protect other people, I think. So what I believe Jesus is talking about is a kind of emotional judo where we're able to, we learn the capacity to let go of things that are throwing our heart 
off balance. Things that are robbing us of peace and joy. This commandment, um, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In the desert, without government, without police, that's the best they could do, right? It's limit your revenge to the, the injury that was done to you. Again, this is in the Code of Hammurabi too. Um, but, let's see. It's very important to realize that the person we're talking about here, that Jesus is the same person that's going to knock over the tables of the money changers. There's nothing in it that says he was violent against the people. But he is not um, being a sheep here. Quite the opposite. There's more power in his response because he's not being triggered. Um, there's something about human nature that, um, well, we see it in children all the time where uh, a child will hit another child and the other child will hit them back. And then the, the first child will go tell the parent, well, I hit him, but he hit me harder than I hit him. Our notions of justice, it always feels like the other person has hurt us worse than we have hurt them. And so we can't follow the eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, because we don't have a good sense of what balance is. So uh, the way Dr. King talked about it, I think is, is beautiful. It's that um, returning evil for evil, returning violence for violence sets up this kind of vortex and we lose control of our own life. We lose control of our own hearts. And I think that's a huge part of understanding at least um, at the personal level what Jesus is talking about here. I think he's also talking about a revolutionary energy that will change the world. But we have to start where we are. And I think realizing that keeping peace in our own heart um, requires a kind of judo, a kind of being able to let go. The word forgive um, in Greek means to cut off, to let it go. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Uh, I think it's similar to what um, um, Marcus Aurelius used to say, and that is the best revenge is not to be like the person who did the injury. So if you're traumatized by the leadership of this nation, the very first part of the revolution is to stop being like that. Discover where you also um, have let capital, capitalism rob your heart and nationalism, and white supremacy, and, and patriarchy. What is the purging that each of us needs to do in our own heart so that we become expressions of the kind of love that the world is looking for? If we want happiness and peace, this is an essential lesson. Whether or not it helps the world, I think it does, but... If I want peace in my heart, I have to stop reopening the wound by seeking revenge and not letting things go by carrying them with me. Uh, with me. One of the best teachers of that was John Lewis, who passed away recently. During the funeral, former President Obama spoke of him. And I think this was a great statement of somebody... You know, he, he believed in nonviolence, but he also provoked um, tension in the system. He didn't just go along. He wasn't uh, passively um, nonviolent. He, it, it, was, um, it, it was an asserted type of nonviolence. And this is the way um, former President Obama put it. He said, it is a great honor to be back in Ebenezer Baptist Church. He says, in the pulpit of its greatest pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King, to pay my respects to perhaps his finest disciple, an American whose faith was tested again and again to produce a man of pure joy and unbreakable perseverance. See, not just that he, he fought for justice, 
but he also lived out love to produce a man of pure joy and unbreakable perseverance. If I want joy in my heart, um, I have to let go of the things that just trigger it and rob it. There are things that threaten my being, my existence. There are things that threaten uh, the justice and rights of other people, and we can't let those go. At the same time, to not become reactive, to, to hold on to, to peace and joy, but also compassion, even for the person who injures, is a way uh, of keeping our uh, peace and joy intact. I also loved, I mentioned um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the insult that she suffered. Did you see her uh, um, response to that? I think that's what we're going to study tomorrow in Conversations of Living because it really is embodying uh, that balance between Dr. King and Malcolm X. She says, in using that language, the sexist language, insulting, vulgar sexist language that this person used, in using that language in front of the press, he gave permission to use that language against his wife, his daughters, women in his country. And I'm here to stand up to say it is not acceptable. I do not care what your views are. It does not matter how much I disagree or how much it incenses me or how, how much I feel that people are dehumanizing others. This is the key point uh, I want to get across. She says, I will not do that myself. I will not allow people to change and create hatred in our hearts. Do you hear that? This other person has insulted her. And she says, I will not do that myself. I will not allow people to change and create hatred in our hearts. If you saw her apology, you saw something very civil, but it was also devastating. If she had responded in kind, if she called him a bad name, this would have been forgotten before the week is over. Her breakdown of his false apology, her diagnosis of what that meant was, I believe, prophetic. And I think it's going to be studied a hundred years from now. Um, it did not come from hatred. It was not reactive. Um, it was loving, but it was very, very uncomfortable. Um, it was an invitation for this person to stop being abusive. And um, again, I'm not 100% sure what Jesus means in, in uh, this turn the other cheek stuff. I've heard a lot of guesses and interpretations. But I think for you and me in this coming week, what it means is that we are going to go out into a week where we can expect indignities, insults, things that could deprive us of our peace of mind. I think what Jesus is saying to us, finally, is to make a promise to our hearts as we go out into this week that we will let go of whatever triggers us, whatever might trap us in the past. And we will promise our hearts to live this week in compassion, in peace, and in joy. And that is my hope for you and I as we go out into this week. Thank you so much for being with us. I invite you now to your own reflections on these words. Thank you.
offering time is a time to ponder the ways that we can share ourselves. It might be financial. It might be an act of kindness. It might be simply sending an email to a friend. There are always ways that we can make the world a more kind and compassionate place. If you'd like to make a financial contribution, we appreciate that. It goes to help keep the lights on, the salaries paid, and to the many ministries and St. Andrew's good effects in the world. But never think that you're in a situation that there's nothing that you have to offer that's good. It might simply be a smile to someone. If you'd like to make a contribution financially, there's a link below or you can go to our church website, Open. Dot org, and use this time to think of ways that you can share yourself to make the world a better place and the things that you're grateful for in your life. prayer time today, we lift up the joys and concerns of our community, our community of St. Andrews, our community in the Austin area, and our community as the one human family around the world. St. Andrews lost a dear friend this week when the Reverend George Holcomb died. George was a retired Methodist minister who regularly attended our Tuesday morning conversations in living. George's was always a voice for justice, even when that wasn't popular or easy. We join our hearts with George's wife, Wanda, and their family as we grieve his death and celebrate the promise of his resurrection in Christ. Bill Hathaway is at home on hospice care. Miriam is awaiting a kidney transplant. We celebrate with our longtime former church secretary, Diane, and her husband, Frank, as they celebrate their 61st wedding anniversary recently. And as we enter into a new month, we remember those people of color who have died at the hands of police last month. We grieve their deaths and repent of our complicity in systemic white supremacy that continues to wreak injustice and violence among God's beloved children. We pause now to say their names. Joseph Denton. James Porter Garcia. Vincent Harris. Julio Jaramillo, Kai Johnson, Hakeem Littleton, Axel Perez. Christian Ramos Murillo, Kevin Ruffin, Jeremy Southern,
Darius Washington. Let us pray. Holy mystery, you create and recreate the world around us. And every glimpse we have of the miracle of creation testifies to your grace, your power, your love. Awaken within us a spirit of joyful gratitude so that we might act with reverence, care, and solidarity toward all your created world. O source of justice, you entered history as a human to proclaim good news to the poor, release to the captives, freedom to those who are oppressed. Nourish our commitment to the heavenly values of your reign so that we might labor ever on in solidarity with you and your people for justice and peace. O font of compassion, you share in the struggles of your children, joining us in our fears and anxieties, our suffering and sorrow, our losses and loneliness. Make your comforting presence known to those whose concerns are even now on your heart. Make us witnesses to your gentle mercy as we tend to the needs of the hurting in our community and aid us to reach new depths of compassion and caring, all so that we might join you in your work of healing the world. Mysterious Presence, we praise you and we thank you for all that you are, for all that you do. Grant us wisdom and courage to live these prayers in the coming hours and days. We pray all this and more in the name of the risen Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Parent of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the people of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread that we need for today, feed us. In the hurts that we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trial too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Thank you again for coming um, and sharing worship with us this week. Our, our lesson today, the scripture, the um, sermon, the scripture, are not things we can really do all the time. I mean, uh, Christianity would be really bad news if the lesson was you have to always love and always forgive and never get angry. Um, I don't think that's what Jesus is trying to do to us. I think what he's trying to say is when, um, when our hearts are closed, when we feel like we're outside ourselves and we can't find our way back, when anger has taken over our lives or bitterness or um, any of the things... Uh, the storms of life that very understandably overcome us. To realize that deeper in our heart, there's always peace. There's always compassion. Uh, sometimes we have to heal our way into that. But to realize nobody expects you to be perfect and to be able to do this all the time. So our parting words today come from a Sufi named Rumi. And I've used this a number of times over the years because I just find it uh, such a graceful way of understanding our journey. Rumi says, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. 
Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come even if you have broken your vow a hundred times. Come, come again, come. As you go into this week, um, don't forget to forgive yourself first, to love yourself, uh, and you'll find it much easier to um, turn the other cheek in whatever way that makes sense in your life this week. So, uh, may the love that we think of as the source of our being, uh, may you feel that going with you, watching over you. May the love that uh, we embody in our personal lives, may you feel that sustaining you. And that mysterious love that weaves us together with the web of being, plants, animals, minerals, things we don't even understand. May these three loves go with you now and remain with you always. Go in peace. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We can't hold back anymore. God, who is faithful, will give us all the courage to answer the call.